and welcome to this extremely interesting and timely and, dare I say, important session uh, on the future of the media programme in Europe and how the media programme uh, can and we now have an opportunity to change it and adapt it and evolve it to make sure that it continues to do the great work that it's done uh, so far in supporting both the industry uh, and producers working within the industry and, of course, the audiences who consume the content. Um, we're going to have, uh, I hope, a pretty deep dive. Uh, it's fantastic at a conference like this to, to get the time uh, to actually really uh, look at the issues instead of skating over the surface. So I'm hoping we're going to get to have a pretty deep dive. I've got some fantastic people uh, with me today on stage. Uh, sadly, one of our panellists, Stefan Arndt, was unable to attend. So um, normally I hate moderators who use panels as an excuse to talk about their stuff, but um, I am going to actually occasionally offer the point of view of a producer because I run a production company in the UK that works with emerging talents, uh, pilots their work on often advod free platforms and then seeks to upsell the results to premium platforms both in traditional broadcast and SVOD. So in a way I span the whole sort of spectrum from the bedroom creator all the way up to, for example, we just made a kind of 10 million euro series for Disney. Uh, where we worked with talents from France and the UK and, and in fact, Canada. Uh, so with me on stage uh, today uh, is Antonella Di Lazzaro, who is, I hope my Italian accent's not too terrible, Antonella, who's the Deputy Director of Digital at Rai in Italy. Uh, next to her is Christian Bombrun, who is the Director of Entertainment and Digital Services at Orange France. And last but not least on the end uh, is Anna Limbach-Urin, who is the Director of Programming Department at NC Plus in Poland. Um, I will ask these guys to talk a little bit about where they come from and, and their experience to date uh, in a moment. But I think first what we'd love to do is invite Claire Burry, uh, who's asked to just say that she's from the Commission, rather than give you her full, uh, slightly uh, terrifying job title. So here is Claire Burry from the Commission uh, to set the context here um, and hopefully set us up for what will be a very vibrant debate. Thank you, Claire. Thank you very much, Jesse. And thank you to the panellists. Thanks to Anna. Thanks to Christian. And thanks very much to Antonello for being here with us this morning. It's an absolute pleasure to be back at MIPCOM. As I mentioned in the uh, previous session, it's my second time here. Um, and I have to say that it feels even more vibrant this year uh, than it did last year. Uh, it's great to be able to talk to people from the industry to understand what's on their minds uh, and to know what they think is important for business at the moment. I hope. Uh, that you are doing lots of deals, lots of partnerships, but I hope that we can also try and make uh, here today a better and a stronger partnership uh, between the European Commission and our media programme uh, and you and what you're doing in the business world. And I'd just like to take the opportunity as well to say a big thank you to my colleagues, uh, to Martin and Magda for the work that they've done organising this, also to all the colleagues who are running our media stand. So what we'd like to talk about is the future of the media programme. We're on the threshold now of the next 10 years. What do you want to see uh, in the new media programme? Just to put it in context, um, the media program was last year 25 years old um, and we have moved on. It was adopted at the same time as the Television Without Frontiers Directive. That sounds quite quaint now, doesn't it, the uh, Television Without Frontiers Directive? But anyway, so it's been 25 years in existence. What we have tried to do is improve cross-border circulation uh, of all kinds of cultural works. But here, of course, today we're focusing mainly on uh, TV productions. We've also, we've done this, why have we done it at European level? Why do we bother? There are two things. One is uh, to try and improve the competitiveness of the industry. But the second thing, and probably the most important thing, is that we promote this wonderful cultural diversity uh, that we have in Europe. And I think, given where we are in the conjecture of European history, it's important that we continue to do that, huh? that culture can speak to people and can bring them together in ways that sometimes politics can't. So it's really important that we continue to do that and make it very relevant. TV is hugely important in terms, in terms of the number of audiences that you can access. We see, I think, some really interesting developments about high quality TV series. We also, I think, see that there are great challenges now in terms of digital content and innovation and how we can try and harness those for the industry. So 
in the media programme so far, we have tried to support across the value chain. We have actions in training, we have actions in development, we do, we focus on co-productions, but also we do market access, which is why we have fund some stands today uh, for independent producers to come along and be at MIPCOM, which otherwise is, is a very expensive place uh, for them. Uh, we, through our co-productions, we have about 12.5 million uh, euros a year. It's not a lot, but it's not nothing either. It can be a significant amount. We have some proud successes. Uh, ones from the past will be the bridge or the jour polaire. And I'm very happy to say, we mentioned it uh, previously as well, that we have Babylon Berlin, uh, which had its premiere last night in Brussels, but was also um, viewed here. What's interesting about that, I think, is that it's a co-production between a private and a public broadcaster. Again, a co-production, the kind of thing Jesse said that you've been uh, involved with. What is stunning about the production, I think, those of you who haven't seen it yet, is the script writing is fantastic. Huh? Absolutely fantastic. It's about a really interesting period of European history, the Weimar Republic, when we went from the First to the Second World War. So I think this shows as well just how, if we can get a co-production like that, it can be really relevant uh, for European cultural development and speak to people about their history uh, in a way which dry history books can't always, you know, through those uh, couple of hour, hour and a half or so, you can really speak to people's minds and hearts about what happened in the past and why our European project is so important these days. Because young people, I think, um, it doesn't appeal to them in the same way. No? We have to be more relevant and we have to show. And this, it has been a commercial success. Uh, in the first uh, week, uh, a million views. Uh, it's the second, in Germany, it's the second most viewed production after Game of Thrones. So we're talking pretty significant there. And even in Spain last weekend, El País said that this showed a new way of storytelling in Europe. So if a German production can produce that kind of reaction in Spain, and it's pretty significant, not speaking uh, across borders. So this, I think, shows why it's, why it's so important. We've adapted. We've started to focus on drama. We've diversified along with financial models. We've also now worked on a guarantee facility to make sure that we have more financing, that we can leverage the money that we put into it. But what do we see now by way of the future? What do we want to talk about today? What's going to happen over the next 10 years? So... It's an obvious statement, of course, that digital is driving change, uh, that we have more and more convergence, and that the media program has to adapt to be relevant. But what do we want? What will audiences want in MIPCOM 2028? We think there are three issues, but I'm sure that there will be other issues, and you'll tell us whether we think we're focusing on the right things or not now in the discussion. We think we need to be able to reach out better to audiences and to understand audiences better, and partly we can do that through data. But it's not just scientific, no, of course. It's about emotion, it's about feeling, so there's other things uh, that come in as well, but we've got to reach out to the audiences. The second thing is supporting the adaptation to the digital revolution. And the third thing is increasing flexibility and a cooperation in the value chain and how we work together. So I think we're really interested to hear from the panel, from people like you, Jesse, who've been involved in that in terms of what, what, where can we make a difference in that respect. So to conclude, there will be big pressure on EU finances now in the coming period. That's a Again, a statement of the political obvious, but we want to keep the media program. We don't just want to keep it, we want to expand it, we want to make it more relevant, and we want to fight for more funds uh, for all of you who are in the industry. So tell us today, let's talk about what you want. Let's do what you are good at, ideas. Let's be creative, let's think out of the box on how to do that. But then I think we have to move not just from talk, but to action. So we will need you to be present with the political decision makers. I said it in the previous session, I say it again, I can't repeat it too much, but you have to be with us now in the next year in fighting for this programme, in expanding it and making it relevant for the next decade to be sure that we're still here in MIPCOM 2028. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Claire. That was um, extremely useful in terms of setting the context of this conversation. Um, okay, so I've, I've talked a little bit, too much probably already, about what I do. Uh, so let me uh, now ask my panel um, just to help uh, you guys all understand, um, you know, where they fit and uh, what they've been doing uh, thus far in life. Um, so Antonella, please do 
explain to everyone what you do and what led you to this point. Good morning, everyone. Uh, as Jesse said, I'm current deputy director at RAI, and my previous role included that of being vice president at Viacom for Italy, running the MTV and the Viacom channels in Italy, and that of country director of media at Twitter Italy. Um, we heard that it's an obvious revolution, that of transiting to the digital world. Where are we at as public service media and as RAI? Uh, we're actually trying to transite RAI, the, public, the Italian public service, from a traditional company to a uh, traditional broadcaster to a more contemporary media company. And uh, yes, that's an obvious move to make, but it's not culturally so obvious uh, within our company. So what we're doing in is trying to transform from a TV scheduled center company to a content center company, investing in digital strategy a lot, but also investing in the digital inclusion of the Italian population, because digital divide is still one of the main issues for the content to travel to non-linear. So my contribution to the panel today will be that of uh, one of the largest content producers in Europe, which is also a public service media, through the lenses of the digital uh, development strategy and the digital distribution strategy. Thank you. I, I very much look forward to that perspective. <laughs> Christian, tell us a little bit about who you are, where you come from, and what you do now. Hello, everyone. So I'm uh, Christian Moura. I work for Orange, and uh, I'm, I'm in charge of the content business, and uh, I'm uh, among other things on the French, uh, French market. So Orange. Uh, I think we are the half of uh, everything we're going to talk about. We are by nature digital. Orange, just to remind you, is 29 countries, uh, 269 million customers. Uh, and yeah, that's all that. That's you are that disruptive player, Christian. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> You're messing it all up. Yeah, no, but TV, guys. Uh, uh, no, let's come back to t uh, on TV. Uh, we have 8.5 on eight uh, globally uh, set of box deployed, and on French market, only 6.5. Yeah. So we are a big player. And yeah, we, we basically distribute all digital content coming from music, from games, or yeah. set of box uh, have become game consoles, uh, also digital press, comic strips uh, launched uh, this, uh, this summer. So uh, we have plenty of things. Uh, regarding uh, TV, uh, we have the, the partnership with the legacy player, the linear, of course, we distribute the linear channels, but also the new players. We were the first one to, to have a, a, a global deal with Netflix, uh, which we renewed. Uh, uh, a couple of months ago, yeah. we are the number one player on VOD, uh, transactional VOD. So I have to say we are pretty much uh, everywhere. So, and we try to push and to uh, increase the usage of uh, digital media consumption. So, um, my expectation would be, what's wh where can the regulation go in, uh, yeah. and where the helps can change to to help us grow and to help us maybe retain some, some kind of local production, what is what is achieved at this stage yet, but also some kind of local distribution, but let's talk about it. Well, I think um, it's, you know, it's fantastic, isn't it, to go from Antonella, who is coming from the point of view of a public service broadcaster transitioning into a digital producer with sort of, I'm assuming, certainly European and maybe global ambitions, to a, to a, to a player who you know, begins in a completely different model of distribution. And actually, in a way, it's about trying to find, you know, the commonalities between you both. So that, you know, as, as Claire was mentioning, you know, Babylon Berlin is a partnership between a, a public service and a private broadcaster. And, and, and I'm sure that, um, you know, lots of the audience will sort of around orange, Christian. You know, do, I mean, in my... I'm going to sort of play the most ignorant person in the room here, right? Because, you know, my first contact with Orange as a brand was you used to provide my phone contract. So my, my sort of major contact with Orange in my sort of emotional, you know, experiential contact with Orange has been as a, t as a telco. And, and I'm sure that lots of people in the room uh, have, a, have, a, have a more subtle appreciation. But, but as, a, as, a, as a company now, does Orange think, what, how does Orange define itself now? Do you define yourself as a... As a content, as a content brand, or is it like, how is that that transition from where you where you came from to where you're going? Where where are you at in that transition? Yeah, that's a very good one because we are in process of uh, 
trying to redefine uh, who yeah. we are and right. trying to define uh, who like, we, yeah. we are going to be <laughs> in, the future, in the future. But let's yeah. say, yeah, we're still a telco. Uh, and I think what we do globally is, and the first task we have to do is to provide great network, both, both on broadband and mobile. Yeah. And in most countries, what, what we do, if you look at what we do in Africa, right now we are clearly focusing on deliver, delivering the best network as possible. In some European countries, I would, I would mention Poland, Spain, and France, we have move beyond that point uh, up to other areas content being part, being one of them but not only uh, we, we have we have a strategy of diversifying ourselves uh, French people in the room are probably aware we are about to launch a bank which I'm also in charge of uh, by the way and, uh, yeah we have both uh, that's not the topic yeah we bought a local bank and we will launch orange bank so well, orange is orange is a telco orange is a content brand yeah. orange is also a bank so orange is, is many things <laughs> okay now, I would say now, now I would say, terrified yeah <laughs> <laughs> but our, our goal is to bring a relevant, relevant service to the to the customers. But it's service. interesting, isn't it? Because obviously, traditionally, phone companies have competed on price, you know, and and then now Vodafone in the UK, I think it's called Viewsy, isn't it? Their new content play. So, 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 I, I mean, I don't even know if Telco is the right word, but you know, companies who came from where Orange came from. Uh, do you think you are now starting to see content? as one of the reasons why I, as a subscriber, as a, you know, looking for a new phone contract, go, oh, the only place I'm going to be able to get Babylon, you know, Babylon Berlin, Berlin Babylon, is on my orange phone. Are you going to start using exclusivity as, of content exclusivity as a reason to subscribe, do you think? Up to this stage, we have no vertical strategy. Though we don't think that uh, uh, creating exclusivity between uh, content and uh, a telco is the right way to, to, okay. to go. Uh, we, we, we think ourselves and as a semi-open platform, meaning that we partner with best player. Okay. We want to make sure that the best content is available for Orange uh, customers, but, right. but we don't want to limit that content. We, we think I that see. from the, the, the industry point of view, the media industry point of view, that limit the, the, the viewing and the okay, advertising revenue. Uh, and that's not good for industry. And for, uh, for, for, for business like us, uh, we, we, we're not in that strategy. So some of our competitors are, but uh, uh, let's say the, well, let's we, are, we are more focusing on uh, best experience, best quality, and uh, let's say the widest uh, range of content as possible for okay. our customers. Antonella, we're going to talk about that more in a minute, okay? Uh, because that's really interesting. I find that a really interesting, you know, because as you say, some people are going with that and some people are not. So finally, sorry to keep you waiting, Anna. Please do tell everyone um, where you've come from and where you are today. Good morning, everyone. My name is Anna Limbachuren. I am in Poland based a company which belongs to Canal Plus Group in France, but also to Vivendi Group. You have mentioned the great cooperation also on Polish market. We have a partnership. NC Plus, the company for which I work, has a great partnership with Orange. We bundle our services, our content, which you said best content. We hope our content is the best with your services, which are telco services. Uh, I'm responsible for programming for broadcasting 16 of the channels on Polish market under the Canal Plus brands, but also we have some thematic channels and I'm also responsible for acquiring content to a satellite platform. And what we do since few years, we are producing locally series because as uh, we know, TV programming is booming and this is why I am here today because of local series and of the help that we see from Creative Europe, from the media program to local series productions. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, so um, let's begin with where we are today, um, because I think it's easy to sort of presume a sort of um, a, a level of agreement that maybe we don't really quite yet have as to, you know, where things stand. So, you know, let's just talk a little bit about, um, in terms of where the sector is today, let's talk about opportunities and threats from your point of view. So let, let's start with you, uh, Antonella. What, what do you see as the sort of primary opportunity threat kind of for from from either from Rise perspective or, or from your perspective as a media professional, what what would you identify there? Well, I would say I will talk from a public service broadcasting per perspective, Great. and I will say that uh, uh, of course PSM, as we are now calling them, to abbreviate, are the largest investors in in content in in, in Europe. Public uh, service. Public service media. Media. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. They spend more than eighteen one eight 
billion euros per year, and yeah. actually their spend increase, according to the EBU Media Intelligence Survey, yeah. Yeah. by s nearly 7% in yeah. the past five years. Yeah. Uh, and that doesn't go together with the increase in the revenues, which has been just 1.4% yeah. in, in the last five years. So I think there's an opportunity there, because uh, public service media are keeping and increasing their, their, their spending content, their budgets. Uh, also, I think, as Claire mentioned, co-productions are on the rise. Like even in countries like like Spain and Italy that traditionally did not co-produce, uh, co-productions are starting to be relevant. Yeah. Uh, we did co-produce uh, with Rai Fiction. We did co-produce I Medici, Masters of Florence, which is a series yeah. that was funnily enough distributed on Rai and then on other European channels and contemporary on Netflix. Yeah depending on the territory. Yeah. So co-production is on the rise as well. So I think there's a big opportunity there increased for content spend, producers. Increased opportunity to cooperate. To cooperate and to co-produce and, and contents that do travel across borders, uh, which is something that we did not see before. So in that sense, you know, the media programs focus on constructing its funding criteria. I mean, the, currently the TV program I think I'm right in thinking you need three participating broadcasters in order to access the funding. And we can talk about, well, you know, is three the right number? Is that the right way of doing it? But currently, a mechanism that encourages cross-border co-production is a good thing from your point of view. Absolutely. Yeah. If we do increase the flexibility, but we did say that as a premise gotcha. of okay. the accessibility Great. of the funding. And what about threats? What about threats? Talking about broadcasters, I think, so far their biggest fear has been of cannibalizing their own TV share, yep. which is the only available metric of success. Uh, Therefore, they did not invest in nonlinear as much as they, as they could. They did not dare in, in commissioning and acquiring rights for other type of contents. So I think that's, that's been the threat so far, but... Uh, so, you know, the much, you know, the, the, the much held up example of the music industry resisting, 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 whoops, iTunes. Exactly. Got it. And I think we are behind iTunes now in right. television terms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so... Christian, talk, talk, talk to us about opportunities and threats from, from your point of view. Opportunity, I would say um, you are here this, in, the, in, the, in, the, in this fair, the, the testimony of the relatively uh, wealthy industry. I'm always amazed on uh, how much production is, uh, is, is growing. And, uh, and uh, here, of course, it's about TV production, but uh, look at the feature film industry. It's, uh, it's amazing uh, what we're doing, uh, both, in, both, of course, in the US, but what's happening uh, in Europe and yeah. what's, uh, what's also happening in China. So we are lucky to be uh, working in an industry with so many countries and so many new things and so many new things being successful so yeah. uh, I would say that's a that's a, not a more opportunity but what's happening uh, what's happening right now I would say that from my point of view it could be uh, improved so coming back to today's topic on what's happening in Europe if you look um, at the production side we are all aware, especially in countries like France, but probably in feature film, we are producing a little bit too many movies uh, with uh, so many, too, too many of them having limited audience. So probably the industry should focus on probably producing less movies and making them l more funded uh, and more successful, more successful. Regarding the TV, uh, uh, the TV program, we have to say that besides the fact that yeah, it's uh, the media programs helps uh, to create co-production, if you look at the ratings uh, and the success of the pay TV program in every European country, it's mostly local content. I mean, countries content plus US content. Uh, it's uh, we have, of course, there are counter example, but in many cases, uh, it's it's uh, these mixtures, and uh, they are. Not a mean example of uh, 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 European co-production, which has become a, 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 a European-wide uh, success. So I have to say that that's one of the things which would is a debate is uh, how can the, the, the European Commission help not funding but creating a, a European-wide uh, uh, audience and uh, right. uh, business success uh, right. out of uh, feature film and uh, and the TV content. That would be my first point. And the second one is. Is, is more into my own business, is re, re, regarding distribution. There is a lot of money being invested, both, both by uh, 
let's say, uh, sorry uh, to cause that, but legacy player, I meaning TV channel uh, and uh, both free, both uh, public, uh, uh, free to wear and pay TV channel like Canal Plus, they invest a lot of money. Uh, we invest money ourselves. Huh? We have a pay TV uh, division called OCS also. And uh, everybody knows that uh, Amazon and Netflix invest a lot, a lot of money in content. One of my fear is at the end, uh, production will remain uh, uh, strong, but at the end, the, the, the distributor who found them all, uh, right now uh, Amazon and Netflix will be the one who remain uh, on the market. And I think yeah. that's, that's something we should be cautious about, is uh, uh, having a, a, a local industry both in production but also in distribution. Yes, I mean, when you hear, certainly it's talking to sort of a local player in the UK who makes, for example, live action programming for kids, you know, the day they all watched Lemony Snicket, that was not a good day because the sheer firepower of that platform to deliver something which is essentially a mini feature film episode to episode, you know, whatever you thought of the show, in a, as a kids broadcaster in Europe, you look at that and you just go, like, I mean, how are we, what, uh, what does that even mean, you know? So, so there's, a, there's a lot to unpack there, but thank you very much. So, um, finally, Talk to us about your, because we were having a really interesting discussion yesterday, uh, which none of you were there, so I'm now going to try and recreate it. Um, <laughs> uh, and it was to do with budget levels and, you know, Poland versus, for example, Sweden and how you connect all that stuff up. So talk to us about opportunities and threats from the Polish perspective, because I saw a fantastic drama series from Poland on Walter, Walter Presents on Channel 4 called, I think, The Border. I think it was fantastic. Anyway, so I, I've never seen a piece of Polish drama before. I thought it was... So promise me that you will. <laughs> well, I was just, I mean, again, from, you know, to, to Claire's point about, you know, cultural understanding, you know, on the one hand, you know, I mean, I, that's just, I mean, one of the things I love about where drama's at now is that you get to go, you know, I've just started reading, watching Subura Blood on Rome. I mean, why I spend from my middle class haven in the shires of England, why I choose to go to the, the toughest places in Europe every night on television, I don't know. But, you know, you do get a view of, you know, the life of these places. So it's extremely enriching, I think. But anyway, sorry. So definitely we had a very interesting discussion yesterday. So just, you know, in Poland, just uh, Canal Plus or NC Plus is a content driven company. So for yeah. us, the most important thing is to produce local series, local programs, because um, from the viewership point of view, they have, they are much above the average of the channel viewership. Yeah. So we do invest a lot of money in this one, but then um, we see our opportunity there that the local content will also be able to travel. I've also discussed yesterday with Fantonella which kind of content can travel abroad. So we both agreed that uh, like premium dramas are able to travel abroad. There are certain types of content that are not so easy to travel, like comedies, but I'm pretty sure that the local series that we do uh, will be also very interesting for uh, other European and maybe not only European countries. I would like to mention that I just read yesterday, and I'm very proud of it, that uh, our main competitor, HBO, they made a local Polish series, which uh, will be broadcasted on HBO in US. It was already broadcasted in 19 countries where HBO is available in Europe. So it's a great success, the, the, the great success of Polish series, and I hope that Canal Plus will uh, go there as well, so somewhere into not only Europe, not only Canal Plus France, but also somewhere abroad to, to other countries. So this yeah. is the opportunity that uh, we see. But I think the threat is that if you produce in local language, like Polish is only known for us, no one else is speaking Polish. So just uh, first of all, when there are people who acquire content for different channels or SVOD platforms, this, oh, wow, but uh, you know it is in Polish. I'm not sure if, if this is something that, that suits uh, uh, my viewers. And this is the threat for us, just to con uh, that people will not just look at those because it's a very local, local one. And I hope media program will be able also to convince that if Scandinavian series could travel, the, the local one from Central and Eastern Europe are able to travel as well. And, and you were saying yesterday that, for example, one of the current um, 
rules is around the budget level that TV series need to be operating at. I think it's a million euros an hour or something of that yeah, sort, it's, isn't it's it? It's 10, 10 million euro per, per uh, production, so 1 million euro per episode, which is obviously not the budget that we have in Poland. We have four times less or three times less per episode, which is already quite good to produce really premium series. Yeah. So for us, the barrier into entering into the program is for sure the um, like the criteria which we cannot match, so I hope this will be something that we can discuss for the future program for the just to improve and and just uh, that the countries which the production budgets are much much lower will be able to apply as well for financing. So I think that was one of the things that emerged yesterday in our discussions, Claire, was that you know there is a sort of disparity in terms of production cost, which of course means you can get more value on screen. Yeah, half a million dollars in Poland will get more value on screen than half a million dollars in Sweden or the UK or you know or somewhere else. And and how do we? recognize that fact in a way that allows less well a cheaper cheaper places to operate but also you know less financially able territories to sort of partner with with you know the richer you know ones because or... it is cheaper in terms of the financing but not cheaper in terms of quality so yeah, just exactly. we That's still can it... do very good quality stuff on yeah. polish market which do not cost 10 million euros Got it. and just i believe can travel abroad as well so um Okay, we've got so much to discuss, and of course the clock is, you know, immediately flying past. But but let's just talk about your experiences or observations about the media program. So, um, in terms of what they do now, uh, Antonella, what what have you seen? What really work from the media program that you think is sort of illustrative of of sort of how the future could look? What, what what's your sort of big? What, what's the thing you see there? Well, for instance, we had a very good partnership on animation, yep. which is, by the way, one of the genres we were uh, saying can travel across borders. Yes. So in terms of, uh, again, I'm talking from the perspective of RAI and PSM, but animation, it is something that we will uh, continue to invest on, and I think we are in, uh, in the best position to deliver contents to the target yes. audience. So that's something that we could continue to partner on with the media program. Uh, the thing is uh, to contrast the incumbent players. Uh, it's not only a matter of uh, uh, discovering and producing series, it's also a matter of making them travel through marketing campaigns, yep. through distribution deals, uh, and enabling them to really be on the market. So this is one of the points I wanted to raise uh, as what's working well. So uh, what's working well is the, is, the, is the media support for the animation business and what maybe we could look at for the future is strengthening those products' routes into the marketplace and how they... Absolutely. How, Absolutely. How easy it is for them to operate. It's interesting. And also the films, yeah. like, uh, again, some of us uh, have uh, their own film department yes. uh, uh, that commissions and produces films. Of course, the life cycle of a film is much longer. So we do tackle and we do uh, have support for media in the distribution of our films. Yes. But maybe we've shot films three or four years ago and they're not... Uh, in the market yet. Yeah, I mean, and certainly if you know, we obviously we were kindly, thank you, Martin, supplied with some briefing papers. And, you know, you look at the, uh, the specific films, you know, I mean, obviously these are just some, some um, examples, but, you know, I, Daniel Blake, wins the Palm Door, and, you know, these are, these are extremely, you know, uh, fabulous and rightly recognized international things that probably wouldn't exist. Um, whether or not you would go to a screening of one of those films and see many young black citizens of Europe watching the screenings or Asian or, you know, underrepresented, you know, how wide that scope goes in terms of delivering citizen value, which I know is one of the things that the program has to do. So I think, you know, there is a discussion to be had between us all about what sort of content, what sort of dis distribution strategies and are actually going to reach those audiences. Because, you know, in, in a previous life, I was head of marketing at a big theatre in London. And, you know, we knew that culturally the biggest barrier to attendance was the theatre itself, because it was a sort of temple of high culture, which very, very many people in our audience found extremely intimidating. So we actually had to take our productions out of the temple, you know, and go and meet the audience where they were. So I think there's a whole discussion to be had about, you know, cinema, art, audience, engagement, access, 
you know, and, and I think that's something that we could, I, I'm glad that you raised that about the distribution thing as well. And so. I'm really glad you raised the temple metaphor because I think that could easily be applied to the state, the perception of public service media in Europe yeah. now being appealing just to a very old audience, yeah. so being a temple in itself. Mm. And that's what we're trying to overcome and really yeah. break through yeah. with the nonlinear. Fantastic. Thank you. Good on you. Thank you for doing that for us all. Uh, Christian, t talk about, from, from Orange's perspective, things that you look at in the media programme. I don't know how much contact your platform has had in terms of participating in products that have come through the programme, but what's your observation either from within or without that process? I have to admit, uh, but uh, don't, don't, don't be mad at me, but I think uh, uh, Orange never used uh, the media programme at this stage. Right. Um, I think one of the reasons is um, uh, none of our division, uh, neither our movie studio, our studio, or pay TV div division, or CS, or even, even our VOD platform. Yeah. Because my understanding is the media program at this stage is mostly focused on on co-production uh, yeah. among uh, per uh, among multiple territory, which we haven't done uh, 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 that much at this stage. And, and uh, it's part of the reason why you wouldn't do that is because you are a pan-European service, so you wouldn't really, you would always be looking as a single player to produce something for the whole is of we are not, Truth is, we are not operating globally uh, at this stage. Uh, uh, the telco business and the way we handle content at this stage up to up to now is is very local. So the, um, my, I, I myself am in charge of the French business. So my, my colleague for Poland and Spain, let's say the two big countries in which we operate content, they have their own their own strategy but we are trying to move away from that and uh, that's that's my change uh, we have announced where we are about to invest 100 million euro in tv series for the coming for the coming years so uh, um, on top of, uh, of feature film and to do that we are discussing with orange countries and with other companies like dutch telecom for example to do co-production co among uh, uh, orange co orange uh, uh, companies and uh, uh, other partners. So, so, so that's something we can uh, yeah we can uh, we can discuss. Uh, and hope I, I the keep, media yes, program. Yes, will I, be I keep sort of looking over at Martin and Claire over there and sort of say that feels like one for the list. You know, in terms of who could be classed as a commissioning organisation within you know within the context of, for example, Orange teaming up with Dutch Telecom teaming up with. I don't know, some, someone, a, a, a legacy player. Such a terrible word, I think. Let's invite, let's invite a new word for legacy player on this panel, uh, if we can. Um, so, Anna, t t let's t I know that you know, from your point of view, it's, um, it's, it's so interesting because obviously you are now, being, as you say, beginning to really play in that very high-end drama field and, and there are some challenges there. So what for you has really worked or do you see really working from a Polish perspective in terms of what the media so is From the Polish are. perspective, as Canal Plus, we are also investing in movies. We are yeah. a co-producer of movies, I think the biggest one on Polish market together with Orange. So we have already benefited from the program for uh, the, the, at least two movies that I remember from, from my history. Right. This is Cold War, which is by Mr. Pawlikowski, who just won Oscar for the first Polish just movie. That. Just, yeah. just that. Just that. We are a co-producer yeah. of this one. Also, we were co-producing with uh, Canal Plus France, the, um, the Innocence, I think it's the, the English titles by Anne Fontaine. We are the co-producer on Polish market as well. So we have benefited and thank you for that because I think the media program is a very important thing and just without that program, many projects wouldn't simply, you know, go to life. Uh, on the series, I've just already expressed my concerns that just we need to feel that the program is also available for yeah. different territories, that those on which the, the budgets are quite high. And, and I'm assuming that in terms of the Polish market, the intervention of the media program in facilitating uh, those production films has a sort of huge hidden benefit in terms of the amount of money being spent in Poland and employing Polish crews and Polish productions crews and so there's a sort of trickle down effect at a citizen because you know last night at dinner I was saying oh but the citizen effect surely is all about the, 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 the audience of Europe having access to European content and the person I was talking to went well yes but if you listen to for example Screen Northern Ireland talking about the amount of investment that that program has brought to Northern Ireland and the number of jobs that's created of course the citizen impact is also about employment in the region. Uh, definitely, because I believe we have great creative people in Poland. Yeah. Uh, the country is quite big, so there are great locations that were never used for um, either series or movies yeah. that, that you can use. So just please feel invited to Poland and just to have a look, because <laughs> our costs are still relatively low compared to other, yeah. to other countries. So I believe that 
Poland as a country can benefit a lot, and mm. not only Poland, I'm just, uh, I think, speaking in the name of also different countries from Eastern Europe, like Czech Republic, Slovakia, or all the other countries. We just started, I think yesterday, we started shooting uh, our new series, which is a co-production between Canal Plus Poland, uh, Czech TV, and one other broadcaster that I don't think I can mention right now, but it will be announced soon, so we are very happy. But again, the budget is much lower than 10 million euros, yeah, so just yeah. it's not so easy for us also to apply for, for some help in, in terms of funding. Understood. Okay. Uh, right, so now let's get onto the tricky subject of where all this is going. Um, which we've already disagreed about, by the way. So it's, I, I think, I think some things are, so the next 10 minutes could be, could be interesting. Hopefully they will be. So um, if what we see um, happening today, if those trends continue, and that is obviously an if, but for the sake of being able to have a discussion, let's assume that the trends, trends that we're seeing today continue. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll begin here, just for the sake of logic. What, what do you think? I mean, obviously, there's, there's, there's the issue of platforms, there's the issue of the audience, and then there's the issue of the content, the form of the content itself. What, what do you think from, from sitting where, and obviously, you sit in an excellent crow's nest here to, to look out upon the landscape. What do you, what do you think, when, when, when we're sitting here, which I hope we all are, by the way, in 2028. It's a terrifying thought. Uh, 2028. What's, what, what, where do you think we will be in 2028? What's the world that this directive will have operated inside, do you think? Well, first of all, uh, it's, 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 it's non-linear, for sure. I mean, right. we surely know that TV is in good health. Like, in Europe, three, three hours and 40 minutes, it's the average TV viewing. Yeah. Uh, that's the average data that's masking a growing uh, age gap between viewers, of course. Younger yeah. viewers are leaning towards online. And also growing uh, differences in countries. In the Czech Republic, TV is still, traditional TV is still consumed a lot, while in Sweden, uh, like if you ask young people between 22 and 44 who don't have kids, their primary, one of their primary means of consumption is Netflix with like 22% well, I, I, and then... I came downstairs and I was like, why does my lovely smart TV, about which I'm extremely obsessive, always have hand marks on it? And I found my three-year-old trying to move stuff around on the screen <laughs> and she went, Dad, the TV's broken. <laughs> and that's sort of a very profound moment, isn't it? Because you go, mm, is the TV, that's the title of a talk or a paper or maybe even a book, you know. Dad, the TV's broken. It's like, what does that mean? You know, so I think absolutely my experience is, is that experience. Is that the, but, but, but we do observe uh, smart TV and connected TV, uh, streaming on connected TV as a growing trend. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of that, but BBC iPlayer, half of their request for streaming comes from connected TV. Yeah. So uh, I think uh, it's very important and we're all equipping to that. Like incumbent players are, um, uh, users are now into a more personalized and direct uh, relationship with the players. That's why we all have to equip ourselves with a better knowledge of data. Claire mentioned so that before. It, so it's non-linear non consumption, consumption by audiences who expect a more personalized feed of content directed specifically to whatever niche they are in. Got and it. this is why also on the uh, non-linear platforms, free non-linear platforms as those of the public service media, we are introducing mandatory signing yeah. in order to study and better know the audience behavior and better serve them with personalization <laughs> and recommended content. And also presumably allow you to operate in this digital single market so that if you're an Italian citizen coming on holiday to France and you want to watch Rise on demand service, you can. You still can keep your, your contents yeah. with you. Plus, we have to bear in mind, in to, to put it into perspective, that uh, single audience measurements will hopefully soon be a reality in many European countries. And that will inform and feedback the form of the content itself. And just to provide an example, uh, at RAI we are launching series, uh, like we, we are experimenting with set-top box, binge viewing, yeah. uh, exclusive content prior to the TV series going on air. And what we are experiencing is that on the non-linear platforms we get users that are not only exclusive to that, con to that platform, 
but also to that content. Yes. So I think the big question for us here is how to capture the value of those users coming to your platform just for that content and then going away. What can we feed them with? What kind of formats and contents can we produce that are light in budgets, of course, but can travel cross borders yes. to retain those users and transform them into faithful returning users? This is very, that is so interesting because we've just delivered a six, an eight times ten minute, so it's mid form thriller to a US SVOD platform, which we shot in England, but which stars. Uh, a man called Corey Fogelmanis, who has 2.5 million Instagram followers who are distributed globally and who are coming to that platform. They're trying to unlock subscription VOD, who are coming to that platform from all over the world. They've consumed his Disney sitcom, Girl Meets World, and that's how he got his 2.4 million Instagram followers. They are only coming for him. And then the platform is trying to sell, and he's contracted to do a whole bunch of social media engagements as part of it. When the casting list arrived from LA, every single actor had a number in brackets, which was their social numbers. And the, and the list was ranked with the person with the most numbers at the top and the least numbers at the bottom. Wow. It's a, you know, so that is a really, you know, and then obviously it's an 80 minute piece that is heavily serialized to prompt binge. It all went up at once. And now we're thinking maybe we should cut this as an 80 minute movie because actually everyone's binging it anyway. So why have we bothered to chop it up into it? It's a sort of completely new way of thinking about the content and, and, the, and the show itself is about an online vlogger pranking a murder, an online pranker vlogging a murder spree. So the whole thing is sort of, you know, anyway. That's a, maybe another another discussion. In fact, I should try and sell you that, maybe. Yeah, yeah you okay. good. Are you in? Okay, great. <laughs> to retain, I'm to retain our users, yeah, I'm okay. in. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was low. All right, sorry. <laughs> Moving on. Uh, Christian, so um, in 20, you know, there's a, um, this is such a hard question, right? But, you know, there you are. You're sitting in Orange. You're sitting on, as it were, the platform of the future. 2028. What's the world that Orange is preparing for? The... The, the, the way I usually explain it, uh, I, 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 tr I try to, to, um, to, 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 to split the value chain. Huh? So picking mm -hmm. up some of the topic you, you mentioned. Sure. F f first level is uh, the content themselves. And sur surprisingly enough, uh, my, my, my view and what we see is uh, the content formats themselves have not, that have not changed that much. No. Uh, if you look at 20 years of time, it, you still, uh, a feature film is still something which lasts uh, between uh, one, uh, one hour, 30 minutes, and two hour, 30 minutes. Remember, mm -hmm. 10 years ago, we are seeing uh, you will have a choice movie, and uh, that doesn't really happen. No. Uh, TV series is always 45 minutes to five, 55 minutes uh, 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 content. And yeah, new content have appeared. Huh? Uh, what you can see on the web and uh, interesting enough is what's happening right now in the mobile industry with company like Black Pills who, uh, exactly. what Kat Katzenberg has announced in the US but that's what format still remains to become a very successful one right now the, f the content itself the content itself yeah. remain for the most part the same what has changed dramatically is the next level the way it's consumed the, the, what I call the packagers huh? the packagers uh, in the packagers uh, that's the TV channel, yeah. uh, not using legacy, the TV channels themselves, uh, yeah. they package content, uh, uh, but uh, at the same layer, uh, the Netflix guy, uh, the, the, the pay TV uh, uh, channels, yeah. they are somehow pack packager of content, uh, yeah. uh, live events, uh, yes, but they yes. package the content. In, it, in, that, uh, in those layers, that has changed a lot. Uh, and is, maybe there is, is a great threat for uh, traditional TV or for pay TV operator to somehow disappear and be replaced by uh, US uh, TV channel. L but look at, look at in, in, look in Europe, uh, in France, there have been a uh, lot of teeny TV channels who have uh, gone uh, and they have been replaced by global, uh, yeah. uh, international, mostly US based uh, 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 channel brand and uh, of course uh, Amazon and Netflix uh, being around. But, but I, so, so what you seem to be saying in terms of you know looking to 2028 is that the form of the content might not have changed as much as we imagine it mm. would sitting here today but the but the suppliers of those that yep. content and the way the pictures arrive on the device we call the television yep and there was a third 
layer, if I may finish yeah. uh, uh, my reasoning, is the, the second layer, the packager, it changes yeah. dramatically. And then the screen and the way you consume content, content is also changing a lot. Yeah. And then that you mentioned uh, smart TVs uh, and uh, mobile yeah. and uh, the network you use to, to watch content is also changing a lot. And then there is another fight. Uh, uh, the one I am more uh, handling myself is uh, uh, the fight between uh, usage on set the box and usage on smart TV. Personally, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm more of, uh, competing with uh, Apple TV and uh, smart TVs yeah. uh, uh, and my, my set box or orange set box. My goal is that people you consume content on the set box. If they consume content on the smart TV on an OTT box, them and uh, I'm nothing. I'm, I'm only uh, uh, a network provider. I'm not a content provider anymore. Yeah. So then there is this, f this heavy fight, which is not entirely a, a content fight, but it's a more um, a distribution and a technology fight. Okay, I think I've understood most of that. But I, yes, okay, so, all right, okay, well, thank you, very good. Um, Anna, <laughs> does anyone have any questions about that? Help me here. Does anyone have a question about that? That is the third layer where I start to, where I, st to talk, the, talk us through that third layer one more time, just just to make sure, because I'm sure I'm not the stupidest. I may be the stupidest person. In the you world. use a device. You, you, at, the, at the end, you you you. So you when pick, you're you, pick, you, you pick a device to consume content. Yes. So uh, uh, when you're on, when you're on no coach, which remote control do you take? Uh, yeah, it's all on my If time. you take a, a, if you take a, a, a Samsung Smart TV remote control to access uh, the yeah. Samsung TV app, yeah. then the one who control the content experience in Samsung. Yes. If you take an orange uh, remote control, yeah. then the, the device you power up, uh, uh, it's uh, orange at the box, the, the, so the, oh, the right. experience okay. you right. in front of you is managed by orange. I'm with so you. one of those guys at the end uh, is on the winning side. So it's owning the relationship with the consumer, it's about the relationship with the consumer, isn't it, the point of delivery, and then when that point of delivery is not owned by orange, you kind of disappear. Yep. Got it. Okay, thank you. I got there in the end. Sorry, everyone. One thing is for sure that it all those devices and all those providers are going into personalization yes. and more direct relationships yeah. with the audience. Even Sky set top box, they have personalization, totally. recommendation, top, center, and back well, there. It, I mean, it's true, isn't it? Because a broadcast attempts to create a mass audience in a local market. So by definition, that a content, you know, Saturday night television at the BBC has to con appeal to pretty much, if they can, everybody. Whereas you could say that in digital, that we're talking about replacing local mass markets with supranational niche markets. And that's actually a completely different form of content. And in a European context, I would have thought there's a real opportunity because you go, okay, we used to try and talk to everybody on Saturday night, and now we try and talk to the people who love mountain biking 24 hours a day. And, there's a, and, there is, and that is a market, in a, that, is, that is a market globally. But in a local market, you could never have sold the mountain biking show because the broadcaster would have said, are you insane? Only 1% of our, our audience do mountain biking. So that's very, very different, isn't it? And as broadcasters in local markets, such as yourselves, seek to compete with people who are increasingly good at super-serving global niches, that's a, that's a huge tension there, isn't there, I would have thought? And intention grows the opportunity. Yeah, there you go, great. And so from, from your point of view, here you are playing in, in some ways as a country, playing in, in, in areas that you really didn't until relatively recently, playing on a very global stage, selling into Netflix, US, etc. Where, where would you hope, I suppose, that your market would find themselves and what's in, in, in this mythical 2028? So basically we believe in our company that the big screen will still exist. Yeah. So either through linear or non-linear, but people like to watch on a big screen. Mm. That's why right now we are just about to launch our own OTT service, which will be an alternative to the traditional satellite platform. And anyway, we're launching it together with uh, smart TV apps, so connected TVs there as well as well as with the box, very similar to the French Cube One, because yeah. we believe that although some people don't want to have a satellite as a dish, but they do want to watch on the big screen. So yes. I still believe that the big screen, bigger and just better in terms of technology, will exist for many, many years from now. 
The second thing that we believe in our company is that as it was with the traditional linear television, the platforms were aggregating content from different content providers, the same has to happen within the VOD world because just it's really hard to have like 10 or 12 applications on your smartphone and then just if I want to watch something, I have to think, well, was it in Netflix? Amazing, maybe just I want to go for BBC. So. First of all, some kind of an aggregator, maybe not content, but the recommendations for sure. So just one place when I can see that what I can, uh, what I can watch, what is available within all of the subscriptions that I have, and maybe some bundles of the subscriptions for the future as well. Because just, you know, we have certain amount of money that we spend for entertainment and we just can't add constantly new app from just Disney pulling out its con content from Netflix, yes? Mm. So it means apart from Netflix, we will have to have like another app costing something. And, and, and to be clear, that's something you're preparing for? It's something that you want to happen? It's... Uh, we are preparing for, definitely, as a platform, as a satellite platform, uh, for sure. That's why we are launching the OTT platform. Probably in the future, we'll distribute so, many other Services. So that's almost sort of Spotify for video. All video available via that one point being supplied by a whole bunch of major labels. Yes, or more like uh, right now you have traditional platforms where you have different packages, different content, so it's just you have like with the linear channels, less channels in the like basic tier, in extended yeah. basic tier you have more channels or so something like this Got into it. the VOD world as well. I see, okay, great. So, just just that uh, to jump in is uh, right now our, our TV packages they mix uh, linear TV and yes. uh, subscription VOD uh, service that we bundle with a single price. Huh? So that's uh, yeah, that's where the, the, the probably the market uh, is is going at this stage. And yes, many uh, multi multi service network. They have. Uh, they are all working on uh, unified search and unified right. re recommendation engine. I, I guess what we, what you mentioned, and uh, uh, we have one. Uh, but look at uh, in US, uh, a good example is Xfinity from Comcast. Uh, yeah. the, the, the engine is, is very nice. It's working on all the metadata from all the, the suppliers. Got As it. for ourselves. Uh, we still miss uh, Netflix metadata, but it's coming in, in a couple of months for uh, Unifar Search. We'll handle all the content, including Netflix data, net, uh, metadata, to search on okay. all the content. Right. Because so it, it has to be convenient for the client, for our subscribers, absolutely. yes, and this is the way we go as well. But, it's, but there's a tension there, isn't there, in a world where we're trying to maintain plurality of voices, where we're trying to make sure that the, you know, the, the, the Polish cultural experience is present on the European stage and Italy too. With this idea of single, you know, single access points, or, or single search points, or, do you think there's a tension? I mean, what, what do you think there's a tension there between plurality of voice and because obviously, you know, you used to sell 180 territories, and now you know you sell what you know. It's like what I'm going to sell to Netflix, and that's it. That's my deal done. You know, that's that's it. You know, so so how does that? What, what, what's happening there? I think I think there's a huge potential for European media and and the creative sector to innovate, but since there are all these issues on the table or opportunities, we're talking content here, we're talking technology here, yeah. and we're talking rights and distribution here. Yeah. So I think uh, I would really love to pitch to the to the to the European Commission for the new media program a single program one-stop shop program that could combine, support, and enable technology, the technological issues, so yeah. the innovation in technology, the innovation in content, and also the rights and distribution as a single package. Because in the end, those are all things and topics that must be combined in order to uh, be equipped to work in the next 10 years. Mm. And also without a strong rights and distribution foundation at a European level, it will be quite difficult to, to then talk or compete or, 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 or you know, make deals with, with incumbent platforms. Mm. So I think a scheme that could combine those three aspects will be really helpful. So, well, that's a very perfect segue into the next thing I'd like to talk about, really, which is, you know, in terms of what the media, ca media program does now, you know, what, what would you really encourage the media program to continue doing? 
and what would you suggest to the media? I mean, we're also going to, and, and, you know, and I'd encourage everyone in this room to be thinking, because you know, as Claire said, this isn't going to happen in a, well, it shouldn't happen in a vacuum. And certainly if, if it does happen in a vacuum, no one will have the right to complain about the results. So everyone here has a kind of duty to be having ideas, like proactive ideas. And I'm going to be coming to the panel you know, at the end of this to say, well, you know, let, let, let's hear an idea, a suggestion that, that Claire and Martin can put on their, on their ever-growing list, I suspect. But um, in terms of what the media program is doing today, what would you encourage them to continue doing and what would you suggest to them that they should start to do perhaps that they're not doing yet? So once more, it's very good that the media program exists because it really helps. Yeah. I think what it encourages right now, and it is good to a certain extent, is that it um, like helps to co-produce, so just we need to find another partner from different territories. Maybe something that we can think about is whether free territories or free broadcasters attached to the program is not too much for certain projects, so just maybe two would be enough, for example. Okay. But I would definitely encourage to continue just to meet or force to meet different cultures, different countries within Europe to work together because it's very important. It helps everyone just to develop, to see new ideas, to see new perspectives yeah. and just to... Uh, like uh, propose different cultures in different places. Personally, I really loved the show Midnight Sun, which was French-Swedish production, where just we could see how northern Sweden works. There are still superstitions, people with mobile phones in their pockets still believing in certain old traditional yeah. stuff. Yeah. Uh, and together with the multicultural, I mean, just different languages that were in that show. I love that very much, and I think this is the way the media program should continue as well. Yes. But also we should allow, and I will stress it, I think for the first time, to also the, the local, more local regions which are not so rich to be able to uh, also find its uh, space within the media program. Got it. Thank you. What would, you, what would your suggestion be about where, what to continue to do and what to perhaps to develop? I think we all um, phrased the fact that uh, co-production on TV series uh, was something yes. that uh, everybody is uh, yeah. pushing and uh, we all hope a bigger production will, uh, will happen yeah. and uh, we hopefully with the help of the, the media program. Uh, I would come back to um, the, the platform, my point on platform, and I think uh, we should not forget that... Um, Local platform needs some help at some point. Uh, if not, they are, they are in a real threat to, to be gone uh, in 10 years' time. And, uh, and um, in the, not to pick, talk about politics, but uh, on a new ele newly elected uh, uh, French government, there was the idea of uh, Netflix European. So I don't know at uh, which point something like that can happen, but yeah. uh, my belief is. Uh, if such a project could be helped by the European Commission at some point, that would be great use. I think, I'm, again, I'm a partner with Netflix, but I deeply believe that Netflix needs a local competitor, and it's not there yet. Got it. And lastly, we are, I have a more concrete suggestion we have been discussing uh, with the media program is, uh, is regarding, it's regarding VOD. Uh, we, we, in most European countries, there are local uh, transactional VOD player uh, besides yes. the, the global one. Yes. And what we see is those players, they have almost all the feature film uh, US and local production available, but uh, we hardly have access to all the movie uh, content from all the other countries. That's right. just not there yet. Right. So I was, we started discussing uh, with the media program of having something like a global repository of content which will, will uh, the, all the local transactional VOD player could uh, d d dive in and, and, uh, and display uh, all the European feature film uh, uh, locally. Okay, and and transactional VOD is relatively easy to, uh, to achieve. Got it. Great. Thank you. What would your suggestions be to the media program for what they should continue to do and what perhaps they should um, develop as a way of thinking? Well, connection is, is, is a very important point, connecting broadcasters and European production, connecting uh, the European yeah. uh, different realities and culture. Although, uh, uh, and I think it's the first time that I phrase it, uh, differently from Poland, sometimes the funding for the bigger uh, broadcasters are probably um, they target primarily smaller scale projects and so the founding are 
a little bit low and they yes. entail difficult procedures. Yes. So that's the remark. Uh, as I said before, animation has been one of the things that we exp exploited the most uh, together mm -hmm. with film founding and mm -hmm. film distribution especially. Mm -hmm. And uh, for the future, as I just said, I will pitch really a dedicated scheme to bridge technology, content, and rights and distribution with a strong European foundation for, for rights and distribution. Yes, I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? Because, you know, we work with young, say, for example, you know, two, we, you know our, our model is we'll, we'll pay for, we'll, we'll invest directly into making pilots of new scripted IP ideas from emerging creators because our, our thesis is that if you're an emerging creator today, you're in a schizophrenic place, whereas on the one hand you never had it so easy because you have a camera and a laptop and you're a production company and you plug that laptop into the wall and you're a broadcaster and you know things that were impossible, certainly when I left university. However, on the other hand, if you're a new and emerging creator, it's really, really hard to get your break because traditional media is you know, in, in under pressure and is spending a million euros an hour and with all due respect, you're never going to you know, give a million euros an hour to a young creator. So, so how does that new generation of talent you know, find a place in this ecosystem. You know, meanwhile, all the new players are busily commissioning, you know, as in, are you, you know, we, we do far more business with USS Vods around new British creators than we, than we do in Europe because they've, they've understood something about the sorts of material those creators are going to make and the audiences they're going to appeal to. So, so when I hear about a million euros an hour and three participating broadcasters and all of this stuff, I have to say, I think... But how does that speak to and connect with a new generation of creative talent? You know, the way, you know, our first feature film, we delivered for £28,000 as an 80-minute sci-fi movie directed by a 19-year-old that then won Best Horror Sci-Fi at Berlin Independent Film Festival, you know. Now, we made that movie for 28 grand because when you go to that guy's house, it's like the deck of the Apollo 13, you know. He's got hard drives taped to the walls and computers he's rigged together and, you know, he's doing special effects which, you know, we, we, we did a sort of blind tasting with the US distributor and said, what was the budget of that film? And he said four million and we spent 28,000 pounds on that. So, so again, I just think that, that, that in this drive for, and I'll put it in parenthesis, quality programming, there's something else going on here about a whole nother level of creativity, which frankly often finds its distribution point on platforms where younger audiences particularly are congregating. And you are watching, you know, I mean, I don't know what the average age of you know, the average television audience in Europe is, but I'm guessing it's probably north of 40 now. Well, that's a huge problem. I mean, that is a gigantic, gigantic problem. So unless we find a way to make content, you know, for audiences below 40 that they genuinely engage with, I mean, bedroom creators and vloggers and prankers and all the different genre of programming that's grown up on YouTube, fine. But the top of AdVod is, you know, all those creators are all going, how do I make the step up into premium? How do I start to make things which have a longer shelf life, which, you know, like a film or like a big drama series actually get to travel? And certainly, you know, from my point of view, one of the, one of the big things that I'd be, I think, pushing for in terms of, you know, where, where, where the criteria could shift would be around lower budget creation, digital distribution, and what you were saying about, you know, from the, you know, from development all the way to distribution is a real strategy for how do you make these things stick? Because in the end, you know, our show will be driven by a US platform with US expertise about how you reach audiences below 30 and they will reap the benefits and their subscribers will go up. And where's Europe in that conversation? We shot it in England with a larger, you know, so it's a sort of, you know, there's a catch up, I think, in Europe to do with the opportunity. And, and, and the money just isn't quite there yet. And I think it is somewhere where the European Commission can make a massively powerful intervention in a world where you can make, you know, our, our, our ten-part series was, you know, below half a million pounds. So, again, there's a whole other world coming here um, to do with distribution and, and creativity, which I think down, I mean, I hate that word grassroots because it immediately sort of sounds like a charity, but down in the grassroots of creativity and distribution, I feel that there's a sort of missing, there's a missing piece there, you know. Okay, I did warn you I would speak from a producer's perspective. Um, uh, 
So finally, um, I've asked each of the panellists uh, to prepare a... Um, I'm, we're running slightly behind now, so um, I'll, d I'll do my best to get through everything that we have, we have to do. Um, I've asked... If you had one... I mean, you may feel that in the course of the discussion you've already sort of spoken about it. Do you feel that you've done that? Yeah? How, how are you feeling, um, uh, Christian? Do you, do you have a, a, a suggestion that you feel that you haven't yet made to, to the media programme, or has it emerged in the course of our discussion? I think... Uh, I phrase my message. You've done it. So, uh, very good. Thank you so much. And uh, and how about the Polish perspective? Have you, have you? Do you think you've you've framed what you'd like the media program to be? Yes, to definitely. Be thinking it was about? already said. Yes. Thank you so much. Great. So, audience. Okay, this is the moment. All right. So, I want you all now to really think about either a question or a suggestion. Um, this is the beginning of what will be. Um, a long process of discussion and consultation, I'm sure, on the part of the Commission. So, does anyone in the audience have a question they'd like to ask, or a point they'd like to make, or a suggestion? Um, and I'm sure one of you is sitting there thinking, I do, but I don't want to go first. Please go first. Fantastic. Thank you. This man at the back. Uh, that's much better. Uh, it was interesting that you mentioned that somebody with his Apollo 13 room was able to come up with some fantastic and very creative material that across the boards everybody said was just stellar. Yet I see a certain resistance on a lot of the corporations on taking a risk on new developers who, especially ones that don't have 50 to 100,000 euros to develop a sizzle reel, which is two to four times what that actual product cost sure I don't see that being addressed because a lot of these younger and more creative talents are therefore boxed out of the situation they cannot break into the market let's say they show up here and they want to pitch an idea no one will even talk to them yeah so how could that possibly be addressed by this new evolving platform that right now seems to have uh, set up to deal with as you said the north of 40 group, and you want to pull down the younger group, of course you have the problem with binge watching and how do you actually market and, and get the ability to fund these. I think the funding thing is solved by what that individual did. It was brilliant. It's 28,000 pounds, you know, nothing to fund. Yeah. But there doesn't seem to be an avenue or a market for these younger creative talents to actually come to a venue like this and promote their ideas so that they actually get it, you know, get a hearing at least. So I guess what, what, what we're talking about here is how can the media program or, or some form of tariff or levy or something be directed towards, specifically towards the mentorship and promotion and development of, those t of that talent layer, is that with that? Precisely. Got that. Okay. Do, does anyone have a have a? I mean, that that feels like a, a point that uh, Martin and Claire are writing down. In fact, unless I'm much mistaken, um, do we do we do you have a yes? Antonella, what do you think about this? Well, I think uh, as much as the traditional broadcasters will progress into their nonlinear strategy, they will more and more realize uh, that they do need this type of this type of content to retain the young audiences that we were talking about before. Also because there is another elephant in the room that we didn't mention, Facebook. Who's seen the Facebook watch application? Have you seen it? I've seen it. It's like an OTT player per yeah, se. Totally. And I think, although I do not have proof for this concept, that Facebook is trying to go directly to the creators. So whoever, is. whoever uh, is. is a traditional broadcaster or a traditional content creator will be completely disintermediated by them going to this young creator. So on the one hand, potentially watch will be an avenue for those people to emerge, but on the other hand, I think the more traditional uh, realities will be forced to look at that. Yeah, I mean, if you're a young creator in the UK with ambitions to make premium content, you go and talk to YouTube Red, you go and talk to Go90, you go and talk to full screen. And now you go also to watch, to Facebook watch. And you go to Facebook. Those are the people who are buying, who are funding, you know. So we will all be, uh, hopefully sooner than later, forced 
to well, it would be that. it would be a pity to have to hit rock bottom, wouldn't it, before we actually think, hold on, there's a whole creative community that we've missed. But anyway, yes. Yeah. Does anyone else have a thought on uh, this? We have some experience on Polish markets about these young creators because we have found a Canal Plus series lab. So basically when we were just taking a decision to uh, produce local series, we found out that on the Polish market there are not enough scripts that we can work on. Yep. On. So we have decided just to finance the program and there was no age criteria, no experience criteria. Everyone could just simply join the program and send an application. And we were really surprised because we thought that if we will have maximum 20 applications of the ideas, it will be like really a huge success. And we got over 100. So we just had to even postpone the deadline where, because for us it was difficult to go through it and we really read every single material that we got. Yeah. And initially we were planning to finance two or three development for the scripts. Finally we have decided for four because there were really Fantastic. great ideas. Yeah. And right now we are still in development. The, the program is already one year old. So uh, we have, uh, first of all, we have uh, financed classes for those people, but real classes by the famous experienced people who just told them how to write, how to make a yeah. cliffhanger, what is the like That's dramatic question. It was very, very interesting for them. Some of them had some experience already and for some of them it was really something new. And right now we are at the moment, just, it's just different projects are on different development phase, but we have already like, I guess, four episodes of one series, which is the fastest one. And we are very happy and I'm pretty sure that we'll start producing it in 2019 or maybe 2020. So this is the way that the young creators without, or not even young, because you just, there was no age criteria. You could be like yeah. 50 and decide yeah. to go into that, that a field so just they could apply and go with us fantastic thank you um i'm conscious claire that i want to invite you to to wrap this up how long do you would you would you like for that final comment five minutes okay so i'm going to take what is the one more question from the audience this gentleman here thank you Hello. Hello. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. I'm oh, good. Uh, we're from Amsterdam. We run a branded entertainment agency, and a lot of our bro represent people like Nike and Heineken. And they're starting to move their, as ad revenues fall, move their budgets away from TV commercials into long form entertainment and want to get involved in that game. I wonder what, what, what role brands play within the future of entertainment, and could they be a kind of fourth type of co producer that broadcasters would, would work with? That's a very interesting question. Thank you for asking it. Does anyone, I have loads of opinions on this, but I, I <laughs> no, I don't want to start. I'd say everyone will hate me. You start, go on. What do you think, what, what's your feeling on that, Christian? Uh, not exactly my, my area of expertise, but um, let's say that um, I would take it for the technology uh, layer. Uh, I think one of the topics we are working uh, on right now uh, allows brand uh, to interact uh, in a new way with content. Uh, you probably heard of uh, targeted advertising on linear TV, which is uh, growing very fast in the US, uh, also happening in UK, but uh, not live uh, if I'm right anywhere in Europe, but uh, it's, it's being deployed. So the, the technology, investment in technology will, uh, will allow us to target uh, ad uh, on uh, per individual base. Uh, and that open up uh, new opportunity for uh, TVs, platforms, uh, using uh, a high quality network to create a new, new type of content. Yeah, yeah. Antonella, do you have a do you have experience of brands commissioning in Italy? Well, commissioning per se, not yet. Although even the campaigns that we see sometimes are like short films yeah. or films in their own. Uh, I think they will, and they may become, and that's why we also have to concentrate ourselves on the uh, distribution side uh, and on creating transparent avenues, platforms for contents to travel no matter where they come from, and to reinforce our co-production, distribution um, um, agreements, both with transactional rea uh, realities or SVOD, or any sort of, uh, of partners, really. Was that, there was that series in the US, wasn't there, Chipotle, which is like a sort of fast, sort of healthy fast food chain, commissioned factory farms, which was a sort of very, very dark comedy about 
you know, the fast food industry and the way food is treated. It was very interesting because on the one hand it was a complete, it was hilarious, really well written, really great people did it, but it was entirely to do with Chipotle's agenda about trying to kill the other com competitors in, on the high street around unhealthy fast food. So it was, it was a sort of interesting thing because, you know, liberally, you know, one's, one's politics, mine certainly look at that and go, hurrah. But on the other hand, you think, but it is entirely Chipotle's agenda. Um, we should stop. I'm really sorry. I could, we could talk about this all afternoon, all morning, and for the rest of the day, probably. Uh, Claire, um, I'm sorry. I've only left you two minutes now. But um, I'm sure that I'm sure that the reading okay. demo. All right, I'll try to be quick. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Listen. Thank you very much. That's been brilliant. I think. Thank you so much to the panel for uh, the different perspectives. Um, I think. What would I say? First of all, Christian. Uh, your point about convergence, it's gone so far now that Orange is buying a bank. Huh? Uh, that was my last job, financial services. It couldn't happen to a nicer group of people now that they get uh, digital innovation in their lives. Huh? Um, secondly, I think what was the highlight was, uh, Jesse, when you tried to do the deal on stage with Antonella. I mean, normally it's taking place uh, you know, in the back rooms here, but you tried to do it on stage. That was pretty impressive. Huh? And the last thing is, Anna, I want you to be an ambassador for the media program. Huh? I want you to come to Brussels. I'll come to Poland. I want you to come to Brussels because you showed why you can speak much more eloquently than we can about Poland but not just Poland our Midnight Sun uh, programming as well. Thank you very much happy to help whenever I can. Okay perfect so we're counting on you. Um, yeah, no, <laughs> but more, more seriously maybe more seriously what do we take away? Um, I've got four minutes left now so first of all there were the points around the criteria of course and the difficulties we very I think we take your point. Huh? Um, Magda, who's a Polish colleague who's in my team, explains you know, what the problem is in terms of if it's about 10 billion, then it's, or 10 million, it's very difficult for you. Huh? So that, I think, is something we could fix quite quickly. Martin says we might only need to check with Lucia, who's the head of unit. So we could actually deliver on that quite quickly, I think, yeah? subject to Lucia. Um, but then, of course, the point that Christian made about the other players and came up several times about needing to be more flexible now about how we can integrate the other players and so on. Huh? Of course, we give money to the producers, but we need to take into account, I think, the fact that there are going to be more and more uh, involved. You mentioned the brands as well. Let, let's think about how we can be creative in that respect. So we take that away. The bigger point, which is a tricky one, I think, was your point. Um, Martin said it's by the young for the younger. Uh, the guy in his bedroom and the audience, uh, you picked up on that point as well. Why not do that at European level? We're too much betting on the things that we think will already be a success. Um, but, of course, we'd like to be more innovative, but we have to show the European added value. So I think we'd be open to think about that, but then tell us how, and maybe because we're talking in a different sphere now, because it's online, it's online content, perhaps the potential is that much more, is that much bigger. So taking a risk can be a calculated risk at that point, but we need to be able to explain to the decision makers, the auditors, etc., why uh, that will make sense. So happy to take that forward. Let's see how we can do it. The second thing I think was about audio and demand. Christian's point that he made at the beginning about uh, the commercial success, how do we grow the part of the pie, how do we move from this just 67% of um, prod productions uh, that don't move from one country to another, what can we do about that? You, I think, you gave some very interesting examples about, it's about promotion, but it's also about, Jesse, your three-year-old with the hands on the TV screen now, and I saw once as well uh, a kid opening a magazine like this, a very small child, and going like this. <laughs> no, this is what it's about now, and Antonella, you underlined that. I think it's about the personal touch, and we have to see how we can bring that in as well and how we can help uh, our producers to be able to take account of that. It's partly about audience data, but it's partly about little things like that that they also uh, need to cover. Last, but by no means least, the value chain. I think there were some nice ideas there. I like the one-stop shop. Yes, I think we're trying to do that, but we need to extend it a bit. Let's see how we can go further on that. Kristen, you mentioned um, European Netflix. Yeah, we've been tossing this idea around. We've been talking to the industry about it. The problem is, I think, Jesse, you were very strong on that, about how diverse um, we are in Europe and how different it is. I'm not sure that a European Netflix would work in practice and make sense, but it's a good idea. Let's think about it, let's talk about it, also because it may give us other ideas about what to do with our value chain and how we can best promote it. So, um, in my last um, minutes or seconds, I would like to say thank you very much for the talk today. That's what we asked you to do, to talk. Secondly, thank you for your ideas. I think you did your industry proud by being creative 
uh, by explaining and by telling us what's needed. Let's now please, and here I appeal to everyone, not just the panel, I don't just want Anna in Brussels, I want as many of you as possible in Brussels uh, to pass that message back to the members of the European Parliament, to the commissioners, but also to politicians in your home countries about what's important for you when Europe sets into the cultural space and how we can make sure that indeed in MIPCOM 2028, we are not just here, but we are a thriving part of what's going on in the TV business and in the online content business and in terms of creative value in Europe. Thank you very much.